Vonnegut is, I'm now at the second section, narrator is liar, and um, <clears throat> Vonnegut is a humanist, and at this point in the 70s, humanism meant um, not patriarchal masculinism, which is what it's come to mean now, because it's associated with the Enlightenment and a whole, it's a whole argument about this. A humanist at the time was somebody who, um, in this case, joined, Vonnegut actually joins uh, an organization. <clears throat> I'm trying to remember what the name of it is now. But it's a non-denominational, non-religious organization seeking to do um, basically good work in the secular world. So um, it's sort of like UNICEF. It's like that kind of thing. It's like, or the UN or Médecins Sans Frontières, you know, Doctors Without Borders, um, or any number of NGOs that are sort of aimed at the public good uh, without making any profit. And that's the kind of thing that, that Vonnegut uh, believed in and joined. And he basically believes, and he says this in one of his uh, later essays, um, you know, can we have no more, like enough of love, love affairs? Because, you know, he, he's at this point, in a, by this point in his life, he's, he's in his late 50s, I guess, uh, when he writes this. And he is, he's sort of burned over with, the, it's like, ah, you know, he's been married a couple of times and he's had kids. And he's like, you know, love is fine and good, but really it's, um, it's decency that we want to in, inculcate in people. We want people to be decent to each other. We don't need to love them to love each other. But if they could just please be decent to each other. And he says, you know, can we have some common decency? And there's a there's a essay in Palm Sunday where he says, you know, how about a little common decency? And his fiction comes out of this incredible well of, of sorrow and of humor. And that's very common um, for American humorists particularly. And usually the sort of the, the most famous American humorist is probably Mark Twain. Um, and the Mark and the Mark Twain Award is is usually given each year to um, comedians who uh, essentially have, you know, done done salutary work because comedian comedy is often seen as a corrective, a social corrective, and there's a great deal of of uh, sort of work done on this, and you can see why. Um, so people like George Carlin, let's say. Um, or, you know, before the revelations about his masturbating in front of women, Louis C.K., Dave Chappelle, Chris Rock, um, uh, oh my goodness, uh, the, guy, the guy who had, who, uh, had a terrible time with drugs, um, at, just before Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, uh, who's a, oh my God, I mean, the, the, there are times when you're listening to Richard, Richard Pryor and you're, you're just so horrified, you can't laugh, and other times when it's just, uh, yeah, it's, it, the comedy is so cutting and so brutal and so true, you know. So um, this, the thing about comedy is that it can get at truths in ways which people will find tolerable, which they might not find tolerable if it's told straight up, but if they can say, oh, well, that's just a comedy, it's like, okay. And there's a sort of ironic laughter, which a satirist particularly can provoke. Vonnegut looks with affection and suspicion at all war stories, um, but stories especially that are his own. And uh, he says on page 85, and I, I do love this, this quotation, it's just such a beautiful line. He says, Earthlings are the great explainers, explaining why this event is structured as it is, telling how other events may be achieved or avoided. And this is on page 85, as I say. And this is very true in the sense of um, we we want to have reasons for why something happened. And we are quick to explain um, because it makes us re feel reassured that this won't happen again. If we can just set things up right, you know, that will make sure that that terrible thing never happens again. In reality, we don't know. Um, we can do our best. Um, it doesn't mean don't try. That's not what he's saying. But he's saying that... Um, there's a sort of, the world is upon us and there's not much we can do about a lot of that. Most of it is out of our control. We would like to have control of it. The more we try to have control of it, uh, probably the more anxious we're gonna be about it. Um, the less we try to control, the more focused we are on the small things around us that we can say, well, this is part of my day, all right. And probably the better it's gonna be. 
And um, one of the least reassuring writers is a man that uh, Vonnegut talks about, who is a French writer, um, and uh, his name is Louis Ferdinand Céline. And I'm going to come to Céline in a, in a little bit, um, but not right away. Um, Céline was a French, as I say, a famous French writer who survived. Uh, he was a doctor and he only, he was actually very, uh, he was a very um, ethical doctor. He would only treat the poor. Um, he was himself poor because he wouldn't take money. And um, he... Uh, were, he he was born in 1894, and ironically, um, he was virulently anti-Semitic. So here's somebody who was you know behaved well, except he was a terrible anti-Semite. What are you going to do, right? I mean, if you weren't if you weren't a Jew, uh, he would treat you well. But if you were a Jew, he hated you. Okay, so we it's, there's no reasoning with this kind of thing. I mean, I, I think this is sort of the, the kind of thing that is the life is full of, where we have to accept, you know, this fact and right beside it, this awful fact, you know, these two, you know, good good thing, bad thing. Um, and although he was a pacifist, as the Nazis rose to power in the 30s and then they rolled over France um, in 1940, um, because Celine was French, he was in France when the Nazis came to power, and they like we're, they were like, well, we love you because he'd written these anti-Semitic tracts, and uh, so Celine gets this terrible somewhere in the war. So Celine actually, he and his wife actually survive the whole war, and it's just a series of event, of luck, pieces of luck, basically. And he writes about it very famously in Rigadoon, a novel called Rigadoon, which Vonnegut actually blurbed. Uh, when it was republished in the, oh, when was that, in the late 70s, I guess it was, uh, mid to late 70s. Um, and Celine, and so there's some of Celine comes into the novel, like why am I talking about Celine, right? Well, there are two reasons. One is that um, what some of what happens to Celine seems to happen to Billy, as well as Celine produces the kind of narrative which is going to inform what Vonnegut does um, in Slaughterhouse Five, so he's a precursor, and um, Celine's novels were modernist fictions, but at the same time, they were very unusual, and um, they're real head turners. I mean, they'll they'll turn your head around. Oh my God, they, <laughs> uh, I'll, and I'll show you why. Anyway, somewhere in in there, Celine was uh, smacked on the head with a rifle butt, and. Um, these rifles that uh, <clears throat> both the Germans, it probably was a German, we don't know what happened. Um, so probably was a German soldier who mistook him for somebody else, or he got in, into trouble, or he got he was in, interfering in something, we don't know. Um, and he got hit on the head with this butt of a rifle. And these, these rifle stocks, these, these guns are very heavy pieces of equipment, 15 pounds, 18 pounds, um, and they were, pieces of they really were pieces of steel and wood and that they had a, a, a full solid wood stock um, which they of course got rid of I mean, very shortly um, so he gets this real and th basically it seems as though at after that point Celine begins to go mad quote unquote we don't really know there probably was there was a severe concussion um, and he but he had to f keep on functioning because it was the middle of the war um, he was a civilian and so this seems to happen to Billy. And so on page 25, when Billy finally got home to Ilium after the airplane crash, he was quiet for a while. He had a terrible scar across the top of his skull. This is on page 25. So is Billy, like Celine, insane? Was Celine insane or did he see things more clearly? And this question of seeing and understanding uh, is again enormously important to us and very often if I use the term perception I I often mean it I often take it to mean understanding seeing and understanding seeing is the physical act of, of uh, taking in the light bouncing off something in your in your field of vision basically and it, and it going into your head and going recognizing things you know oh this is a mug you know that's a <laughs> There's me and on a computer, you know, that, that recognition. 
but perceiving is for me understanding where you actually perceive what is going on and you have taken the data that's coming in and made it into information which you then uh, begin to understand so this is something that Billy begins to do, and he becomes an optometrist, not by accident, right? Um, he was doing nothing less now, he thought, than prescribing corrective lenses for earthling souls on page 29. So Billy's life becomes one of let, having people see or perceive more clearly. And Celine's novels certainly function like Vonnegut's, um, and... The, where the job is not to tell you the truth. Now, I have this uh, passage here, which is a very... I, I looked for the passage where my, my memory was that there is a passage that Celine narrates, because he tends to be... He often is the narrator of his own books. Um, so he has... He's written... A, okay, so some of his books are very famous. Journey to the End of Night, Death on the Installment Plan... Uh, The death on the installment plan is a is a uh, a particular reference that we yeah I guess people would still get it um, but there was a there w one of the ways that that people were able to get um, in the post war world there were no credit cards yet um, and so how did you convince people to buy more than they had the money for well um, you put things on layaway and in layaway basically. Uh, you went and paid, you, you saw something you wanted, and you would go and pay the store a deposit, let's say $5 on, let's say you wanted to buy a sofa, the sofa was $100. So you'd go and give them $5, and they would say, okay, we won't sell that sofa to anybody else. And each week you would go and give them $5. And, you know, at the end of, how many weeks? <laughs> did I say it was a, did I say it was $100? Yeah, right. <laughs> so at the end of 20 weeks, yeah, that's right, uh, you'd go and, you know, pick up your sofa because it was put on put aside on layaway. So that's the installment plan. It's the same idea where you sort of take something on the installment plan where you, you they say, we'll give you your television set right now. And then, of course, you pay it off at some exorbitant uh, interest rate um, that you can afford every week uh, or every month, whatever it might be. So this is the, this is the reference. So here I put this... Um, let me put this passage up so you can see what a Celine novel looks like. And uh, he uses a period, an actual period. I, my memory is that there are there are something like 14 periods, I think, total in the novel. But otherwise, he doesn't stop the narrative. And this is going to be very important to Vonnegut. And you can really see where Vonnegut's going to come out of this particular worldview. Um, and so here's his, uh, here's his narration of him getting struck on the head, where it seems to be this is the moment where he comes unstuck in time. He comes unglued, basically. From this moment on, I warn you, my chronicle is a little jerky. I myself, who live through what I'm telling you, have trouble getting it straight. It's like, that's it. Right? This is what O'Brien has been struggling with, and Vonnegut too. And I myself, telling you about it 25 years later, I ham and haw. I'm all balled up. Too many bits and pieces. You'll have to forgive me. Stop spluttering. Just tell us what happened. Right you are. Well, at the exact moment they caught up with us, our pursuers, raving mad, and their four or five jam-packed hand trucks, a balcony that had fallen plunk in the middle of the street and blocked us, blocked off a house that was still standing. Not all of it. Only the front. This is the balcony is knocked down. Uh, what a balcony. Forged iron. I hadn't seen this house from a distance. House is much too is too much said. Just the front and the walls on one court, so it's barely standing. Right, it's like there's just a couple of walls standing, which you would see very often in the bomb cities of uh, of Europe, where uh, there were no roofs. I mean, there were just these you know walls standing with be they hadn't fallen in yet. Very dangerous, um, because of the bombing. Uh, but what about okay? So house is too much said. Um, I remember saying, "This is it. We're fucked." Uh, they'll tear us to pieces. At that exact moment, wham, a bomb, not a little one, a big splasher, thump, and another one nearer. I guess we all panicked, we fugitives and our pursuers. I say it again, I, I guess. I don't know. I can only imagine. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not the fainting kind, but there I was kind of stunned. Pain, but not bad, and blood on my neck. I, I'm bleeding, yes, blood from my cerebrum. No, my medulla, I think. And so this is... You can just see, I mean, the whole book is written in this exhausting uh, sort of the character is just beside himself.